Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Steve Ladvina, one of the board members and one of the health coaches for our Stay Sharp coaching group here at Sharp Again Naturally. Um, quick disclaimer, uh, please note the information in this presentation is for educational purposes only and does not constitute medical advice. Uh, please see a licensed and qualified medical professional for your medical needs. Our information is intended to empower patients, their families, and healthcare professionals who want to collaborate in the most effective ways on this challenging journey to health and well being. Um, so, thank you so much for joining us for this afternoon's webinar, the Airway Sleep Connection That Will Save Your Brain. Um, it's the kickoff to our spring and winter. Uh, webinar series, and I'd like to welcome and introduce our speaker, Dr. Michael Gelb. Um, he is the other face who's spotlighted here with me. Uh, Dr. Gelb is an innovator in sleep apnea, painful TMJ disorders, and other head and neck pain disorders. A pioneer in airway-centric dentistry, Dr. Gelb has studied breathing-related sleep disorders, specializing in how they regulate relate to fatigue, focus, pain, and the effects of all of these can have on a person's life. He is a highly rated author and speaker on TMJ, sleep apnea, sleep disorders, and chronic headache treatments, and heads up the Gelb Center, a pr premier practice in New York City and White Plains, New York, that addresses the needs, an individual, the needs of individuals suffering with these conditions. Um, and if you have any questions at any time, please put those questions in the chat. We're going to reserve a few minutes at the end and Joan, our programming uh, manager and coordinator, and I will ask them to Dr. Gelb at the end. Um, so with that, I'll hand it off to you, Dr. Gelb. All right, Steve, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with everybody. I'm gonna give you my experience today uh, from my Let's see if I can advance these slides. There we go. I'm going to give you my experience today on my 38 years of practice and my last 30 years dealing with sleep, sleep apnea, but really all forms of sleep. And we're going to relate today to how these will relate to your brain. I'm going to speak for about... Uh, Oh, 40 some minutes till about 20 after, then we'll have some questions. So why should you care about sleep? Why should you care about airway? And if you don't know what airway means, I'm gonna to explain to you what the airway is. And I'm gonna tell you why, you, why you're on this, uh, this call today, this lecture. The first reason I think that we sleep at night is to get rid of fatigue. So in my practice, both practices, both locations, the number one complaint is I'd like to have refreshing sleep. I no longer feel refreshed on awakening. The second reason why we sleep is for what I call biochemical refreshment. The brain forms new synapses at night when we sleep. And so that's very important that we keep forming new cells in the brain because the opposite of that synaptoclastic activity is neurocognitive impairment. Immune function became very important, particularly during COVID. So when we sleep, it protects our immune system. It cuts down on things like cancer. And there's a lot of great studies that have been done on, on, on sleep and cancer. We're here today to talk about restoring the mind the brain and memory. And so when we sleep, that's the time where things get consolidated into long-term memory. And the last reason we should care about sleep is that it really helps with our psychological well-being. We wake up in a better mood. We wake up with less anxiety. We wake up with less depression. You know, James Nestor said in his book that healthy sleep is a lever. In other words, we can accomplish things with healthy sleep. For example, it helps our diet. It helps with exercise. And it helps with hormones that regulate things. So healthy sleep allows us to accomplish things as a health coach, as a patient. 
that we never could do without healthy sleep. If you haven't read the book Breath by James Nestor, I highly recommend that you read this book because it'll tell you about how nasal breathing in particular, breathing through your nose can change your life. In my book that I wrote with Howie Hinden, who's on the medical or in the maid board, is really talking about gas, airway health, the hidden path to wellness. It goes all the way from birth, from childhood, up to older age. And it really connects the brain and the heart. And so the airway, if you go up, it really affects the brain. And that's my main interest. But it also affects the whole cardiovascular system and diabetes and inflammation. You know, I took some slides today. I really enjoyed reading and rereading Matthew Walker's book. And I highly recommend that if you want to know more about the role of different stages of sleep, non-REM and REM sleep, you should read that book. If you have grandchildren, children, this problem really starts at birth. And so it can really do a number on children affecting things like uh, ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity. And then the book by a local uh, ear, nose, and throat doctor, Dr. Stephen Park, who was at Montefiore called Sleep Interrupted. All good books. So why are we here today? Sleep apnea affects your whole body. So as we said, it affects everything from fatigue to anxiety to acid reflux, uh, drug-resistant depression, ADHD, arrhythmias. There's about an 80% correlation between sleep apnea and cardiac arrhythmias. So I, I get referral from many cardiologists today because they know that whether it's cardioversion, whether it's ablation, it will not be successful or as successful, or you may not even need any of those procedures if you address the sleep apnea. Certainly cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, and then panic attacks and obesity. And if patients come into us and they're on, you know, a meprazole or they're on over-the-counter uh, uh, medications for, for reflux, we look at that. A lot of patients are on antidepressant, anti-anxiety, ADHD meds, high blood pressure, and then drugs like ProVigil or NuVigil to try to stay awake. And you know, the patient doesn't come in saying that I have an airway problem. The, the, really the problem is that it's hidden. 80% of these patients are undiagnosed. So I wanna give you hope today, and I wanna show you how I can take a woman who comes in on your left, who's feeling fatigued, she's in pain, she's not functioning so well, executive function skills, and then five months later, she looks like the woman on the right. So we're gonna talk about what the secret recipe, but the hope is that in about four to five months, we can reprogram just about every cell in your body and you can feel like a completely different person. You can look like a completely different person uh, and act that way as well. And so it doesn't happen the first night. It may not happen the first week, but if you give it a couple of months, you can see the transition take place. And so when we talk about airway and inflammation, you could say that really the type of work that I'm doing is I'm getting rid of systemic inflammation. I'm helping, and we're gonna talk about the different things we do, and we can talk about why we care about sleep, but by restoring the height of the lower third, by opening up the airway, I'm able to achieve these effects on her brain and on her body that you can only see this, the picture is worth a thousand words. This is the type of transition that we're looking for. And my secret recipe to be revealed today, it's an old Jewish Italian recipe, but it's oxygen and deep sleep. It's oxygen and deep sleep. And so if I restore the patients, if I give them the right REM sleep and non-REM sleep, deep restorative sleep, and I give a patient back oxygen, this is what is possible. And you can see the bags under her eyes. You can see she's not refreshed. She's not well rested. 
And this is about nine months later, and she looks about 10 years younger and feels more vibrant. Cognitively, she's sharper. And this is what it looks like to transition a patient as we open their airway. I'm just showing you physically what it looks like. So I show this model to everyone. So you better understand when I talk about the airway, if you can see my arrow here, the tongue is attached to the lower jaw. When the lower jaw goes back, the airway shuts off. When the airway shuts off, you don't get good sleep, deep sleep, and you don't get oxygenation. When we bring the jaw forward, the tongue comes with it, and we open up the airway to make it like a garden hose. This is really one of the most important slides, and it looks complex, but we really only look to, have to look at the first three lines. So there's basically two things happen when we, your airway collapses at night. So it's primarily when you sleep on your back. So the first tip is try not to sleep on your back. When your muscles relax, your airway collapses and you either get one of two things. You either get this intermittent drop in oxygen or you get disturbed sleep or sleep fragmentation. When that happens, you get everything from your sympathetic nervous system being activated to oxidative stress, which is like rust, to systemic inflammation. Now we're gonna talk about systemic inflammation later, but Dale Bredesen and others look at inflammation as the number one cause of Alzheimer's disease. So anything you can do in your life from better diet to exercise, to meditation, anything you can do to get rid of, getting rid of toxins, anything that decreases inflammation will be beneficial. And then we talk about the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, uh, and then we go from there. So I always ask my professionals, what's your line in the sand? And we're gonna talk about the dental. I'm a dentist by training. I don't do any dental work per se, but there's a number of procedures that we do in dentistry that still close the airway, which I think and I know contribute to neurocognitive impairment, dementia, and Alzheimer's. So I'm gonna to try to give you and give you a little heads up on that. You know, when I open your airway, I make a number of promises to you. And one of the things that I promise is you're going to wake up refreshed. You're going to be in a better mood. Now, this is just with my night guard. No headache, no jaw clicking, no jaw pain, no snoring. I'm going to open the airway. And hopefully, I'm going to give you a sharper mind. Those are the airway promises. That's what I would like to promise to every patient. Can I always do it? Maybe not, but that's my problem. So I like to solve the problem. I like to get to the root cause, whether you call it functional medicine, integrative medicine, or precision medicine, that's my goal. So we call it airway first thinking because the first thing I wanna do is establish an airway. When you think about sleep, a lot of people think about sleep apnea and they think about CPAP machines and that's the machine that you put on, you put the mask on and either goes into your nose with nasal pillows or it's a full mask or a nasal mask and it's attached to a machine. But when we talk about the airway, it's something that we're developing in children, we develop it, we can grow it. We actually have learned how to grow an airway because over time, what's happened is our airways have gotten smaller. Why? Simon Sinek said, why? Well, you know, this problem starts when we're children. And so we're gonna show you in a little bit how we've gotten smaller jaws, crooked teeth, lower tone, kids have sensory integration issues, but this can start at birth, more frequent allergies today. And so I am just intrigued with the brain and it starts with the brain of children that can't concentrate, they can't focus. 
They don't have executive function skills. As we become an adult, it's harder to concentrate. We lose our memory, we get neurocognitive impairment, we get dementia, and we get Alzheimer's. It's an epidemic, it's increasing in numbers. And so it's not just anxiety, depression, chronic fatigue that's going up, and we see that a lot in kids. This is a picture of Niedergaard's work and what we're seeing and what we'd like to do, we'd like to clean the brain at night. We'd like to get those toxins out of the brain. Now, whether it's couples that are complaining of snoring, this problem, and one of the problems with the epidemic, it's 80% or 85% undiagnosed. This problem of sleep, this problem of airway is 85% undiagnosed. That means there's never been a sleep test. Now, looking at kids for a second, when you take a kid that either has mouth breathing, and really it can be just from mouth breathing, snoring or sleep apnea, starting when they're one, two, or three, when they get to be age four, there's a 20 to 60% increase in behavioral difficulties, inattentiveness, and inattentiveness, that's where it starts, hyperactivity, anxiety, depression, peer-to-peer -peer problems, uh, either conduct aggressive or rule breaking. And that starts, as I said, uh, and impaired executive function. So you can imagine impaired executive, ex impaired executive function becomes something else when we're adults. By the time age seven, this is from something that happened at age one or two, this increase is seen when we get to be seven. And there's a tremendous increase, a 200% increase or more, actually a 400% increase in learning disabilities. How did this happen? Well, every generation we're having narrower faces, smaller mouths. And if you've read the, the work of Weston Price, you could read the work of uh, Pottinger. It could be the work of uh, Lieberman from Harvard where I got these slides. It could be Coricini, it could be Nestor. But basically as our brains have evolved, as we've gone from four legs to walking on two legs, as our posture has changed, as our spinal cord has migrated forward and our mid face has gone back, as you can see very nicely in the bottom right, the culprit has been, or really the, the Achilles heel has been the airway. The airway is diminished in size. And so here we see below Neanderthal that had a big broad face. They had large sinuses. They could breathe through their nose. They had huge airways. And today's man, every generation with soft diets, preservatives, glyphosates, all the pollutants that we have, preservatives in our food, every generation we have more crowding and we have small retracted faces. We have difficulty breathing through the nose. We have allergies, we have swollen tissue, but we net effect is we have smaller and smaller and smaller airways with every generation. Our chin goes back as well. This is how we looked like about 8,000 years ago. This is about 2,000 years ago, and coming up here is how we look about 300 to 400 years ago. So you see how much skinnier and how much longer our faces have become. But by far, the biggest change happened in the last 400 years. So I think that's a great slide. So I'll show you another slide like that. This is James Nestor from a talk that he this gave. This represents the sort of facial growth that we had about 500 years ago. As the centuries pass, she starts representing where we are now. This woman represents the sort of facial growth that we had about 500 years ago. As the centuries pass, she starts representing where we are now. This so woman that is my so typical what patient. What you're seeing right now is what has happened to uh, the airways in humans. This is why we have sleep apnea. This is why we have crooked teeth. This is why we can't breathe right. So what you're seeing right now is what has happened to uh, the airways in humans. This is why we have sleep apnea. This is why we have crooked teeth. So if you're a health coach, if you're a patient, if you're a caregiver, 
if you're a son, a grandson, a father, if you're a human being, the problem that we see today, and it's probably a above 50 to 60% of our patients is that this area, starting with the nose and going into the back of the throat, behind the upper jaw, that's the soft palate, behind the lower jaw, that's the tongue. This is an area that tends to collapse at night when we go to sleep. More so in our back, but it can also occur in our right and it could occur on our left. And the reason I'm here today as a dentist is I know that the dental community, the dental team is probably best able to address this problem. Now, in certain people that have severe cases, they will need to go on something like CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure or BiPAP. They'll need to go on a machine. But there's a lot of cases, certainly in children, where we can solve this orthodontically. Not traditional orthodontics, but there's a very small group of us out there that are airway orthodontists. So what do you see commonly in people that finally do get diagnosed with this? What do you see? Well, the thing that intrigued me and I started talking to Lisa about, of course we see unrefreshing sleep. Of course we see daytime sleepiness, but we see this attention and executive function issues. And one of the main things we see with sleep apnea is cognitive impairment. That cognitive impairment can get very severe and move on to dementia and Alzheimer's. So it creates these functional impairments. There's more accidents at work. There's more traffic accidents. There's more anxiety. There's more depression. Now, I'm sorry to read some of this, but I'm going to just take this. This is from the evidence and you see where my references are coming from. This is from the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease. We're looking at the, what's the relationship between sleep apnea and Alzheimer's disease. So we know that sleep apnea is more prevalent as we get older. As same with uh, Alzheimer's. It's been associated with both cognitive decline and dementia, several mechanisms that might characterize. So sleep apnea, we talked about sleep architecture. How much are we getting? Are we getting as much deep sleep as we would like? Intermittent hypoxia, we talked about oxygen, increased oxidative stress, interthoracic pressure changes. Exploring the evidence supporting these possible interactions will be a focus of this review. The effect of sleep apnea, and I'm sorry to read, in increasing the risk for Alzheimer's can be mediated by several of its associated, met and they talk again about increased inflammation but they also talk about oxidative stress, diabetes, hypertension. I think this next slide will show you. So I said, it's pretty simple. There's two things that happen and that's my secret recipe for reversing this. There's two things that happen when you get sleep apnea. You get hypoxia, you get drops in oxygen and or sleep fragmentation. There's a lot of women that I treat that have no drop in oxygen, but they have disturbed sleep. You only need sleep fragmentation. And this is very confusing to a lot of people out there. You don't need to have a drop. So you could monitor your oxygen at night with an oximetry or with, uh, with uh, one of the watches, and you may have really good oxygen, but you may have very fragmented sleep. When you have the drop in oxygen, it's going to lead to inflammation and oxidative stress. It'll also trigger diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease. However, when you have disturbed sleep, you have a drop in REM and a drop in slow wave sleep. And you're gonna see you need slow wave sleep to consolidate your memory. And then you don't get, if you have high blood pressure, you can't get the Niedergaard effect, you don't get the toxin being released from the brain. All of these increase the neuropathology that we see in Alzheimer's disease. So as we get older, you're gonna see there's this age-dependent sleep apnea. And as we know, as we get older, our brains don't produce as much melatonin. We don't sleep as well. It declines through middle age. What I want you to see is that when it starts declining is really in our 20s and our 30s. And as we get older, 
almost all of us see a decline in slow wave sleep and in REM sleep. And we see more time awake after sleep onset. So what happens as we age? Well, as we age, we have more airway resistance. It's harder to breathe. Our diameter, our actual airway size decreases. We generally have more fat pads in our neck. We have lower tone. As we get older, we have lower tone in general in our muscles, and that includes the upper airway. And as we get older, we have more sleep fragmentation. We, as I said, we have reduction in slow wave sleep and increase in stage one and two. How common is this? Well, as we get older, mild to moderate age, apnea, 83% in men, 60%, that's quite a lot. Severe apnea, 50% of men and 23% of women. Here's the kicker. This is for my coaches out there. And this is for those of you that are, Steve, this is for you. Middle-aged symptoms, and you're not middle-aged, but we've got to start being more aware of what's happening in our 30s and our 40s, because when we're tired, we just say, you know what? I'm working too hard. I've got the kids. And when we got to get up to go to the bathroom at night, we go, well, it's just something I'm, you know, it's just natural for aging. And we have these mild cognitive complaints, like where did I put my keys? Where did I leave that? Why did I come in this room? But that's really when this is starting is really in our thirties and our forties, even our fifties. So this article was really good. It's in the journal Brain Science and it's about sleeping brain how can we harness the power of the glymphatic system through lifestyle choices? So one of the big things that we've been talking about for years is that Niedergaard talked about that when we go into deep sleep, the body washes away the toxins from our brain, but you can see that in a young brain that works really well. But when we get Alzheimer's disease, you can see that we don't get as much of those toxins of the beta amyloid don't go and don't get washed away. They really stay in our arteries and they're not getting cleared from the brain. So we want the, the venous pool, we want the veins to take it and clear it out of the brain. So this again is from the lab of, of Niedergaard at the University of Rochester. And you can see that it doesn't really, this clearance does not occur when we're awake. The glymphatic flow, so it's really the glial cells in the brain, the spaces open up in the brain. There's this housekeeping that occurs at night and it removes the toxins, the beta amyloid, the tau, it all gets removed or a lot of it can get removed if we're sleeping well. What are some of the lifestyle choices? I know you didn't count on me talking about this, but I couldn't pass it up. So the more omega-3 we have, better you're gonna do with clearance from the brain, intermittent fasting. If you can try to avoid sleeping on your back, you're gonna get, you'll wake up cognitively feeling better. Not too much alcohol and not too often. Exercise, we, as we all know, is great for the brain and trying to avoid chronic stress. So when we talk about the cognitive effects, so here's the good news. The good news is that, and this study was on CPAP, but there have been a few studies that have shown, and this one's by Sonia and Coley Israel, very great research on this topic. And she showed that CPAP treatment could slow cognitive decline and we know from the work of Bredesen that proper treatment can actually reverse, maybe reversible cause of cognitive loss, which is very promising. Now I had to show this slide because even snoring can contribute to cognitive decline because when we snore, we can also get interruption from that deep sleep. So deep sleep we know is essential People who have disruptive breathing during sleep, which manifests as either snoring or sleep apnea may not get enough deep sleep. The pilot study showed that people that wore a device in their mouth that restored healthy breathing improved their cognitive performance in the early stages of Alzheimer's. And so when we look at the, this is a systematic uh, mini review. It's a little bit of a bigger study. And they showed that um, 
there's clear support now, clear evidence that there's an association between sleep apnea and Alzheimer's disease. As I said, we're gonna keep coming back. It's both the sleep fragmentation and the hypoxia. They're very common in OSA patients and they're associated with the amount of beta amyloid and tau protein. CPAP is the treatment as well as an oral device, but that reduces the sleep fragmentation and improves slow wave sleep. As a result, we get a reduction in the amyloid, uh, beta amyloid and tau protein. So it, again, it helps the slow cognitive impairment, hopefully to reverse it. So what I was saying about kidding around with Steve is that we know that if you have sleep apnea in midlife, you may not have any cognitive impairment at that time, but we know that 20 years later, you're more likely to develop Alzheimer's if you had sleep disruption in midlife. And it's really looking at that non-REM, that deep restorative sleep. So it's very important that we get our 30-year-olds, our 40-year-olds, our 50-year-olds in to get tested. So their study was the first to find Alzheimer's-like amyloid in the brains of people with sleep apnea. Um, in the early stages, they could only find uh, the plaques and the tangles in the hippocampus, precisely where they're first found in Alzheimer's. It was the same thing with sleep apnea. So I took some ex excerpts from the book of Matthew Walker. Um, again, I'm, I'm gonna beat a dead horse, but sleep quality, especially that deep non-REM deteriorates as we age, it's linked with the decline in memory. However, when you look at Alzheimer's disease, the disruption of deep sleep is far more exaggerated than even that we would see with sleep apnea. So this may be bi-directional. It wasn't a loss of just the general loss of deep sleep, which is common. It was the deepest, as I said, of the non-REM sleep. And again, similar thing, but if you read this book, uh, Why We Sleep, I recommend that. You know, there's a lot of you that are clenching at night and your dentist may have put a night guard in your mouth. And what I wanna say is probably one of the reasons why you may be clenching that the highest odds ratio would be obstructive sleep apnea. And if you look at the symptoms, the common symptoms of sleep apnea, you see that down here on the left is impaired concentration and impaired memory. We've known that for years. And so we hope to be able to reverse that. And we see that very commonly that we can reverse that. But if you have a patient that is wearing a night guard, I'd say there's between a 50 and an 80% chance that that night guard is actually making the sleep worse and aggravating sleep apnea. So on the nights where they looked at the patient wearing a night guard, like we're taught to make in dental school, the apnea was up to moderate. It was 17.4 events per hour. And so if your dentist is making a night guard, it just can aggravate the apnea. If you ag aggravate the apnea, you can aggravate cognitive impairment, dementia, and eventually Alzheimer's. So if, you, if you're wearing a night guard or you know any of your uh, patients, clients that are wearing night guards, please be careful and see a dentist that's trained in airway. The primitive night guard has at least a 50% chance of worsening snoring and apnea, closing the airway, worsening cognitive impairment. We of course make a modern night guard. We open the airway, we don't close the airway. And this just shows you in dentistry, and I don't need to belabor it, but dentistry has been closing the airway probably for 85, 95, or 100 years. Our goal today in my work over the last 30 years is teaching dentists how to open the airway with innovative techniques. First taught to me actually by my dad. Here's a patient who comes in, he's exhausted, he snores, he's got apnea, He's got a very narrow upper jaw. He's got a big neck and you can see the anatomy of the neck. This is the type of anatomy that's associated with sleep apnea. And when we look at the imaging, it's exactly what I showed you in the diagrams. He's got a very diminished airway. You can see how his lower jaw is thrust back. You can see that he's got about an inch and a half to two inches of narrowed airway. 
a deviated septum in his nose, which is blocking the air off in his nose, his jaw being too far back. He was treated by CPAP. He had 74.8 events per hour. Anything above 30 is severe. So this puts him in the severe category. Another patient I wanted to show you, this patient has loud snoring, daytime sleepiness, occipital headaches, and chronic fatigue, difficulty concentrating. So difficulty concentrating be, can become cognitive impairment, can become dementia, can become Alzheimer's. She's very, this is called an Epworth sleepiness scale. It measures how tired you are, your chance actually of dozing, how sleepy you are during the day. This is our patient. She had had teeth taken out when she had orthodontics. We can see that she's basically bone on bone in her TMJ. And lo and behold, she's got a very, very narrowed airway. I like this case, she's got a narrow palate. She can't breathe through her nose. And she's got 69.3 times an hour, she stops breathing or partially stops breathing. Breathing, 365 times during the night, her oxygen went down between 4% and 9%. So in other words, her, ax, her, her maximum oxygen was 99%. She went down between 4% to 9%, 365 times. She went down between as low as 81. She went down between 10% and 20%, 101 times. And this shows us how many events, this shows us her snoring. This is the report that we get back from the sleep physician, diagnosing this and telling us how we might treat it, either CPAP or an oral appliance. This is our diagnosis. And we're able to make her a bite plate during the day and we're able to make her an FDA approved device at night that will open her airway, alleviate the sleep apnea, and improve her cognitive function. This is the bike plate during the day, in the mouth, bringing the jaw forward, opening the airway also during the day. This is the narrowness that's created by the poor orthodontics that she had as a child. This is another view of that high narrow palate which is taking away some of the room that she has when she breathes. This is the morph as she is improving. This is from the side and you can see that her head posture, which is interesting, the dowager's hump, you can see how her head posture actually improves. And as we give her more chin and as we open her airway. Also, you can see improving her mood. This is the before where she has no chin. She's got a narrowed airway. She's got a marked dowager's hump or a change in her posture. Her head's in extension. Here, her head's more in flexion. She has more of a defined chin and she has not had any orthodontic and she has better posture. The ear has come back closer to her shoulder. This is now with the device in, you can see the jaws forward and open. And we've basically tripled the size of her airway. We've tripled the size of her airway. That is before and that is after. And it's up close to, I'd say, almost three and a half times. But miraculously, we're able to bring down the number of times that she stopped breathing from 69.3 down to eight. We also were able to take the 101 oxygen desaturations between 10% and 20%. We took 101 down to zero, which you see on the right. And we took the 365 and you can combine the 101. So 466 events we brought down to 13. This is how we change someone's brain. This is how we change someone's function. This is how we change someone's cognitive performance and ability to function.
on the first follow-up visit, this doesn't happen all overnight. And the first follow-up, her snoring was improved. She was still exhausted. She still had headaches. We moved the appliance forward another millimeter to open the airway. Now her neck pain is improved. Her headaches are better. She's feeling more alert. She feels better overall. Her mood is improved. That's the appliance that we used. And again, she's more, she's not sleepy anymore. So I think I finished a few minutes early. Um, Steve and Joan, I'm ready to open it up uh, for questions and I can stop sharing. And if you wanna open it up, I'm happy to open it up. Um, I think we had a couple of additional slides. Let me pull them up and then we will oh. open it up for- I know, I, I, I can go back. You want me to go back to it? I yes, got your I slides. Perfect. There you go. Um, so wonderful presentation though, I think. We're going to have a lot of questions. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning um, of the presentation, we have this is kind of kicking off our Stay Sharp webinar series. We have three additional webinars coming up, um, one on brain boosting nutrition. It's not all just about food, um, one on stress, trauma and brain health and one on the social connection and brain health. And those are the dates and times listed there. You know, you'll notice we're trying to do one webinar a month in this series. Um, and you will get all of the links for these webinars in an email that'll be sent out by, by tomorrow afternoon. If you haven't registered already, they're already up on the uh, sharpagain.org website. Next slide, please, Dr. Gelb. Okay. And in addition to these webinars, I saw in the participants, we have some of our uh, Stay Sharp coaching program attendees and uh, also some names um, that have been going to the mindfulness practice, our Awaken and Energize program. So we have two, these are our two programming offerings at the moment. Um, we have an upcoming coaching program because we just kicked off our current ones. Uh, the next one is in April, and it goes from April to June. It's eating for body and brain. So if that sounds at all interesting, please join the eating for brain health webinar coming up to see uh, the two coaches for that program are also hosting that webinar. And then weekly right now from 830 to 850, we have an awesome new program, Awaken and Energize. It's a free 20 minute um, de-stressing, rejuvenating, recharging uh, meditation and following the Kirtan Kriya practice. Um, and I would like to invite everyone to all those webinars and to these two programs. Um, so with that, we will open it up with questions. And Dr. Gell, we don't have to show this slide the whole time, but I do want everyone to have a chance if they want to write down your uh, contact information um, to get in touch with you. Yeah, so I, I just, thanks, Steve. I wanted to say, I, I left out, you know, talking about Dale Bredesen and the Recode Protocol, you know, he talks about, uh, what, 36 holes in the roof. So part of, part of patching up those holes is restoring, obviously getting rid of inflammation, as I said, any way you can, but restoring ideal sleep is a part of it. And so my uh, Lisa asked, you know, what's what's the least expensive way? What's the least expensive way to uh, see if you might have a sleep disorder? So, I mean, I think it's like uh, you can order a test for yourself for two hundred ninety-five dollars that includes a physician's uh, interpretation. So, if you want to do it in an inexpensive way, for if you want to do it for free. Freeze, you know, it's free. You got to remember that. So you can do Snore Lab, and that'll tell you whether you snore. But remember, there are people that have sleep apnea that don't snore, and everyone who snores doesn't have sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. So if you if you don't have snoring, it doesn't mean that you don't have sleep apnea. So I don't love that one. I would go to, you know, I would go to someone who does sleep testing. I would get start with the home sleep test. So if the, you have, uh, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to ask that 295, that's one of the home sleep versions where you get the equipment, you take it home, you do it in your own home. 
that what you're talking about? Correct, but that's what we do 95% of the time for most of our patients, they're doing a home test. First of all, patients like it a lot. They prefer to do it in their own home. They don't wanna to go to some, especially during COVID, they don't wanna to go to a sleep test and having someone watching them with the camera the whole night. Now, if you're someone that has leg movements that's thrashing around, or you have, you've had quadruple bypass, or you have arrhythmias, the good thing about going for a sleep study is they'll, they'll put an EKG on your heart and they'll monitor your heart the whole time, every hour, every second that you sleep, you'll have a EKG on your heart. So if you, if you have arrhythmias, they'll pick it up. I had one patient, they found that his heart stopped beating one time for five seconds, one time for nine seconds, the next week he had a pacemaker put in. So, you know, sometimes you need to have an in-lab study, but 90, 95% of the time, a home sleep test is gonna be just fine. I think the, the kind of natural follow-on of which, of which there's a few versions of this in the chat is, okay, let's say we find out, um, or we already know that we have um, some airway issue. How do you can address this on your own or approach the subject with a dentist or even find a dentist who might be a specialist in this? Uh, so well, you know, saying. yeah, so that's a great question. So I, I, first of all, I would read the book Breath. You know, I would sleep on your side. I would try mouth taping. I would do whether it's neti pots or whether it's breathe right strips or whether it's mute nasal stents, you've got to be able to breathe through your nose. So if you have allergies, you know, work with a health coach, tackle food sensitivities. If you can't breathe through your nose, you're going to be in trouble. You've got to, you have to be able to breathe through your nose. So you have to address food sensitivities, allergies. That's the, that's the very basis. So work with your health coaches. Um, you know, uh, we'll talk about mewing in a second. Um, you know, I want everyone to have their tongue up to the palate, lips together. So everyone needs to have their mouth closed when they sleep. They need to breathe through the nose. So John Mew and Michael Mew have led us to understand that we need to have the proper posture our mother was a myofunction therapist, so it's very near and dear. So we need to keep our lips together when we sleep. Taping is a good idea, but you've got to be able to breathe through your nose. And some people will need a device in their mouth that doesn't let their jaw drop back and their airway close. Um, there was a question about DNA devices. So what we're doing now that I didn't put in the slides is we're actually growing the airway. So we're now for the last three years, we're actually growing your airway like John Mew does, like Mike Mew does. So if this is working a lot, if you believe what I showed you in the slides that I showed you, if you can understand, and it's true that our faces, our skulls are changing, all you have to do is go to the Museum of Natural History or Smithsonian and look at the skulls from three or 400 years ago, and now look at the skulls today, or look at your next door neighbor, or look at your children, you're gonna see that there's crowding. We don't have room in our mouth anymore. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to make our airways more like our ancestors. We're trying to open the nose, open the palate, make more room for the tongue. And so we can sleep through the night and have better cognitive abilities. And whether it's a DNA, whether it's an mRNA, an mmRNA, whether it's facial beauty, whether you do it with clear aligners, what I will say is that most orthodontists have no idea what I'm talking about. And the orthodontic community, if anything, has been closing the airway and for some reason haven't quite figured it out, but they're resistant uh, to what we're doing. And I have to send you guys a copy um, I'll send it to you, Lisa and Nancy. I'll send you a copy and you can share it. Um, yeah, diet plays a huge role, but I'm gonna show you a, a something that was just wrote by, written by Karen Bott. Years and years of bad diet, soft diet, Gerber baby food, mush like we've been eating. Every generation that we have a bad diet, 
our mouth gets smaller and our teeth get crooked. You can see it in rats, you can see it in humans. Where there's a trend today to give kids bones to chew on. It's called baby led weaning. It's to get the people to eat harder foods, but sometimes you're gonna need orthodontics in order to reverse a lot of this trend. So the promising part of that is we're seeing some good results in um, being able to grow the airway. So that's all wonderful information. I think you kind of zeroed in on one of the things, um, which is how to find that, well, first starting with the idea that professionals who are experts in this are not all of them. Um, so if we're not, if we can't just walk in and go to any orthodontist or any dentist, you know, what um, certifications or qualifications or even just keywords should we be searching for um, to find our own Dr. Gelb, you know, maybe in Chicago or Atlanta yeah. or something? So uh, there's a nonprofit that Howie and Hind and I, Howie and I started a nonprofit called the AAPMD, the American Academy of Physiological Medicine Dentistry, AAPMD.org or .com, AAPMD. So we have a listing on there of airway friendly healthcare providers and any of the health coaches, you're invited to sign up. If you believe that airway is a good thing, you're, you're, you're allowed to sign up. Um, yeah, it's a good resource. It's just great. So that's one way. We also have the Foundation for Airway Health. And that's another way for the public to go on and learn more. We found that the, the, the professionals weren't getting it quickly enough. So we want to educate the public as well. So the public can come and find the professionals that they need in their own community. And what we've encouraged the young people to do is that we've encouraged people to make a community with a health coach, a myofunctional therapist, um, a pediatric ENT, you know, to put everything together that you're going to need. Could be a doula, it could be lactation consultants, you know, really starting at birth and getting uh, speech language pathologists, myofunctional therapists, getting everyone on board that understands the airway from the infant up to the elderly. So it's been a challenge, but that's what's happening now. That's the growth of this airway. We call it airway centric dentistry or airway centered dentistry. And it seems to be, you know, taking, taking hold. Yeah. And for anybody who's not watching the chat, uh, Nancy seconded. It's a great resource. I can third it. And there's lots of great webinars and, and get on the AAPMD's email list. And we will send out a link um, in our follow-up email. So everybody should just be able to look out for that. Um, I think you've addressed all the questions in the chat. So or, um, so if I've missed one, maybe Joan or Lisa can, can research it. Lisa, any comments, Lisa, um, anything? Uh, Lisa, Nancy, anyone, Susan, any comments? I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear yeah. you, Jen. Okay, great. Um, I'll also include in my email follow-up to everyone the list of books you recommended, um, yes. Good. as well as the two organizations. I did have one quick question. Are sure. airway issues hereditary? Well, in that you look like, so remember, all of the, most of these factors are epigenetic and not genetic. Okay. So just cause I look like this, cause I was a mouth breather, that doesn't mean my kids are gonna be like this. So if I can change my kids into being nose breathers when they're two, three, and four, most of it's the expression of our genes and not our genes. So it's not genetic, it's epigenetic, which you guys probably know what that is. Mm -hmm. So with proper diet, reading to your kid, exercise, get them to be nasal breathers, we really can change the way our kids develop. Hmm. So that's good news. They don't have to be necessarily like us if we had this problem. Okay. Hmm. You know, the only other thing that I would add is that um, most of the things Dr. Gelb has talked about today are one aspect, they contribute to memory issues. And as you know, most people associated with Sharpergan know, there are many, many more. So addressing each one is important. And so if, if you think that this is an issue, it's really something to get addressed and sooner is always better than later. 
um, because there is this progression of, you know, if you have a history of sleep apnea or repeated wakenings at night or snoring or whatever it is, it just tends to worsen with age. And, you know, if we're talking about, when we're talking about that global perspective, if you can think of all the different things that Dr. Gelb referenced that this affects on the flu, you can think of it the, from the opposite direction. If you're not getting this corrected, it's gonna make correcting almost every other of those aspects a little bit harder. If you're not sleeping well, it's affecting your nutrition, your desire to exercise, your, your uh, you know, oxygenation. It's gonna, your mood, all of these things are gonna be much harder and all of those things on their own affect your brain health. So um, if you think this is a big issue for you, then it's one to address. And I, I think the follow-up to that or something I was kind of wondering while you were talking is what of airway issues, how many roughly would you say get corrected by, you know, that you see like CPAP versus um, the device versus surgical versus can, you know, the allergies and inflammation reduction steps that you kind of mentioned? I would say that's a great question. And I would say starting with kids, tonsils and adenoids do a lot. I know there'll be controversy on that. If you got to open the airway combined with orthodontics as a kid and myofunctional therapy. In Europe, you know, it's 50% CPAP and 50%, let's say oral devices. Because of big pharma here and the role of Philips and ResMed, it's roughly 80 to 90% CPAP. So the US has gone way, way overboard in this treatment that hasn't even been shown to be effective, mm -hmm. but they make a lot of money with it. And so the problem with these five to 6,000 sleep doctors in the US, they've got one diagnosis, of sleep apnea, they got one treatment, CPAP. Mm -hmm. So they haven't done very well as a specialty of medicine. No one really wants to go into it because who would want to go into a specialty where there's one diagnosis and one treatment? So mm -hmm. I think I'd say that it should be at least 50%, but the trend is certainly growing in my field to correct a lot of this orthodontically to start earlier. And I think the kids are getting on the bandwagon now from watching YouTube and the kids are starting to correct their faces at age 20, 25. They're doing it themselves. They're looking for these treatments because they've, they've looked at the work of John New and Mike New and people like that. Uh, but I think it's really important to be like under the, be, to be under the care of a, a health coach or a functional medicine person that really can put things in perspective. But I think you described it really well, Steve. It's the lever that allows everything to work better. It's the lever in the system that allows your diet to work better. It allows you to exercise because you have the energy to get to the gym. It tells you when you're satiated, it gets the leptin and the ghrelin balanced so you know when you're full and you're not hungry. It gets rid of cravings. So a lot of the things that you're gonna to try to do as a health coach, you're gonna do much easier if the patient's sleeping through the night, getting enough deep sleep and enough oxygen. So that was well said. Um, well, I think that about wraps up our time. So in the interest of respecting your and everyone's time, I think uh, we can wrap up now. But thank you so much for being our guest and um, kind of always being a, a huge resource for Sharp again. I think this was a uh, huge value to me. I learned a lot today and I, I know everyone else probably feels the same way. So thank you for, for joining thank us. You. And Thanks thank everybody. You for our series. Thank you, Joan. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to stop recording. All right. And everyone.